Hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess and welcome to another edition of Book Community, where I keep you abreast of all the goings on, the bookish mess in the bookish community. First, I want to say, so today is the 24th and it is the beginning of the final round for the Shaded Choice Awards. So make sure you check them out. It's shadedawards.com and it's linked in the description below. So be sure to check that out. But let's go ahead and get into it. I'm pretty sure I should just call this series publishing is a hot damn mess because every week it seems like publishing seems to get worse or maybe we just find out more information about publishing that's kind of been hidden behind the veil and that's the majority of what I have this week so there's not a lot going on but a couple publishing things. Also it's raining. <laughs> Is it always raining on Monday? It's raining, so the lighting's not great. I'm sorry. So first off, Atria Books, which is under Simon & Schuster, has a new imprint called Black Privilege Publishing, which sounds amazing, but it is led by Charlemagne the God. His name is Leonard Larry McKelvey, okay? But he calls himself Charlemagne the God, and I don't like him for numerous reasons, but he is the author of Black Privilege and Shook One that were both published by Atria and now he is going to be leading this new imprint under them. I think Simon & Schuster was one of those companies earlier in the year that said they were going to do more and about diversity so I mean this is positive yes I just wish it could have been led by a different person. If you don't know Charlemagne the God is a radio personality. He is unfortunately from my home state of South Carolina and he um, is most famously known for The Breakfast, Breakfast Club, which is a radio show that I think is part of iHeartRadio. And he hosts it with a couple other people and he's just known primarily for controversies. He's very, <clears throat> he likes to push people's buttons and really, he likes to start shit and be messy. And he's just had a history of being misogynistic, being transphobic. Um, and I, ugh, I just don't love that he is the person leading this. I'm happy for the imprint um, being led by a black person, but him, he just, he just has a whatever history. And of course things happen and he apologizes, but he just seems to have, it's just a pattern with him that he's always caught up in some problematic shit, whether that is inviting people on and asking about really sensitive moments of their past. Like he had a rapper Logic on and he asked him about the rape of his sister. Why? I don't know if that really, I didn't, I don't watch The Breakfast Club or listen. So I don't know if there's really a context, but I doubt it. And it made Logic very uncomfortable that he brought this up. He's also made a female rapper cry, was basically telling her like she looks too old for how young she is. Like, you know, she has a really old face. He just is rude. Um, he had someone on there that joked about if they ended up having sex with a woman and found out they were transgender, that they'd kill them. And he it was like, you know, it is a crime, but you should know ahead of time that should be illegal. Like they should be arrested or something if they don't disclose that to you. So he's just gross. I don't like him at all. And he's risen to popularity, I think, from his controversy. And, um, and of course, they want someone who is popular and well known to lead this imprint. But I just think I just wish it was someone else. So of course he did go after this and he apologized. He said, we don't condone those kind of hate crimes at all, not even a little bit. Um, then he spoke about learning how many transgender women had been murdered that year and that 13 of them had been women of color. So, I mean, he is saying he doesn't condone that, but you know, even trying to be comedic, it wasn't funny. And I just don't find a lot of the things that he thinks are funny to be funny. Um. He also apparently joked on air that he basically raped his now wife. I have no problem using explicit words here on my channel, but for this, I'm just going to, uh, I'm gonna edit it because it just doesn't make me comfortable to say this. He said, me and my wife hung out one Saturday night and she got sloppy drunk and passed out in my mama's house. And I got that P word. She was, effing me back and all that but she was really drunk i asked her yesterday yo did i rape you the first time we ever had sex and she goes i mean in hindsight yeah
He's and he had another incident where he confessed that he was um having sex with someone and put a like a pill in her drink and said that she was drunk as shit and wasn't coherent and that she had no memory of the event the next day so can people change? Yes. And I haven't read his books. I have no desire to read his books. Great for him. I hope that he does well with this imprint and really uses this in a good and positive way. I have that the first book coming out out of, under his imprint is by Tamika Mallory. It's called State of Emergency. And she was a Time 100 honoree and co-founder of 2017's Women's March. So this is her literary debut, um, State of Emergency. So and the first release under this new imprint. Um, the book is described as a searing indictment of America's historical, deadly, and continuing assault on black lives. And it will also explore how to best continue the country's onward advancement and momentum towards true equality and social justice. So again, I'm very happy about this imprint. This book sounds like a great start. I just hope that he is better than he was before and that he's learned some lessons because it'll gross. You can hear the, the rain. I need to invest in a ring light. So this is going back to Albert Whitman, which I think I covered a week or two ago, and they are the publisher that um, published Descendant of the Crane by Joan He, if I'm correct in her name. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. And so basically they're not paying her her royalties. So there was someone else tweeted that. So I think something that's overlooked in this Albert Whitman nonsense is this. They also accept unagented submissions. I don't know what percentage of their authors are unagented, but there are definitely some who do not have an agent in their corner ad for advocating for them through this. If you're one of these authors, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you join the Authors Guild immediately and reach out to them with all of your statements and your contract for advice. So luckily, I think Joan has an agent, but basically she's saying that um, Albert Whitman has taken on taken on authors who don't have an agent so if they get in a situation where they you know violate the terms of their contract they're not paying they're not paying royalties it's a lot harder if you don't have an agent on your side so hopefully if there is an author who signed un unagented I don't even know if I'm saying that right with Albert Whitman they see this and or they're already a part of the author's guild because I can't imagine that Albert Whitman would use that and take advantage of people who don't have um you know the proper people on their team so just again publishing is the ghetto Ooh, ah, the ghetto. so I saw a tweet about something with Disney books so this tweet was about Disney books. So they argue that they acquire the rights but not the obligations to pay royalties to the novels of Alan Dean Foster. So the letter basically, um, or it took me to a page which is the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. And so they said last year, a member of this committee came with a problem, which on the surface sounds simple and resolvable. He, was, he had written novels and was not being paid the royalties that were specified in his contract. Um, and so the member is Alan Dean Foster and the publisher is Disney. So Alan Dean Foster's letter was saying, Dear Mickey, we have a lot in common. You and I, we share a birthday, November 18th. My dad's nickname was Mickey, there's more. When you purchase Lucasfilm, you acquire the rights to some books I wrote, Star Wars, the novelization of the very first film, Splinter of the Mind's Eye, the first sequel novel, you owe me royalties on these books, you stop paying them. When you purchase 20th Century Fox, you eventually acquire the rights to other books I had written. The novelizations of Alien, Aliens, and Alien 3, you never paid royalties on any of these or even issued royalty statements for them. All of these books are still very much in print. They still earn money for you. When one company buys another, they acquire its liabilities as well as its assets. You're certainly reaping the benefits of these assets. I'd very much like my minuscule, though it's not small to me, share. You want me to sign a non-disclosure agreement before even talking. I've signed a lot of NDAs in my 50-year career. Never once did anyone ever ask me to sign one prior to negotiations. For the obvious reason that once you sign, you can no longer talk about the matter at hand. Every one of my representatives in this matter with many, many decades of experience in such business echo my bewilderment. 
You continue to ignore requests from my agents. You continue to ignore queries from SFWA, the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. You continue to ignore my legal representatives. I know this is what gargantuan corporations often do, ignore requests and inquiries, hoping the petitioner will simply go away or possibly die. But I'm still here and I am still entitled to what you owe me, including not to be ignored just because I'm only one lone writer. How many other writers and artists are out there are you similarly ignoring? My wife has serious medical issues and in 2016, I was diagnosed with an advanced form of cancer. Oh, we could use the money, not charity, just what I've owed or just what I'm owed. I've always loved Disney, the films, the park, growing up with the Disneyland TV show. I don't think Uncle Walt, I don't think Uncle Walt would approve of how you're currently treating me. Maybe someone in the right position just haven't received the word though, although after all these months of ignored requests and queries, it's hard to countenance. Or as a guy named Bob Iger said, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. I'm not feeling it, Alan Dean Foster. So that is really upsetting, especially for a corporation so big and with so much money, Disney, um that is just fucking garbage that they don't want to pay somebody and like he's saying he's not asking for anything other than what he's owed and that's bullshit and i'm sure they have the right people in the right departments who know they're supposed to do all these things who should be writing the checks so that's crap this um twitter thread was saying alan dean foster is a sci-fi legend a writer who produced a shelf of original novels but also made a reputation novel novelizing movies and TV from Star Wars to Aliens, turning out books that transcended quickie adaptations, becoming beloved bestsellers in their own right. Disney now owns a bunch of these books thanks to their acquisitions of Lucas and Fox, and these books continue to sell briskly. Disney not only isn't paying Foster any royalties for these books, they're refusing to even issue him royalty statements. So Disney has black holed Foster's agents, lawyers, and also the SFWA to the extent that they have communicated with him. They have espoused a radical jaw dropping copyright theory. This is Disney's theory. When they bought Lucas and Fox, they acquired the copyright licenses that enabled them to sell Foster's books, but not the liability, the legal obligation to pay him for his books. As SFWA president Mary Robinette says, this theory could absolutely up in the nature of copyright itself. Any publisher that wanted to go on making money from an author without paying them could simply sell the rights to a sister company, which then denies any obligations. That is just extremely scary. And I hope this isn't setting some kind of precedent. I really hope that he gets paid, but it's just so hard, especially going up against a corporation the size um, of Disney. And it's just shady. I get, you know, Disney has a special place in people's hearts because of Disney movies and Disney World and whatever. And I appreciate Disney movies. Disney World is fine. I'm not like a, some Disney super fan, but uh, this is shitty. And uh, it always seems, it, no, it always is. The, company, the companies, the corporations with the most money don't want to pay people. I hate it. It's awful. Someone said, how many others are also being screwed by this? Star Wars alone has a long list of credited authors. And as Alan Dean Foster says, even my namesake franchise, the Aliens universe, isn't limited to just one author. Who knows how many people are getting screwed over, but it's just a fucking disaster. I... Mm. The fact that Disney has is in publishing, like, that's money. I just think that's shitty. And I hope that bringing awareness, I don't know, people calling them out on social media might help. I really don't know if they're ignoring his lawyers. I don't know what we could do, but I just wanted to bring that up. Um, it's fucking shitty. Okay, you get to enjoy editing Jessica's side pony, but I forgot that someone sent me a thread and it's referencing Sasha Allsberg, who is a big booktuber and an author. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't I've never watched her videos but I know of her and anyway the thread started and it said I'm trying to imagine the reaction slash criticism I'd receive if it were me taking mid-pandemic transatlantic trips and selling arcs. Um, being a bigger creator in a community definitely brings more than a fair share of criticism but damn if it doesn't also come with some protections smaller creators and other community members have to think a bunch of time before criticizing and mostly it ain't worth it anyway don't sell arcs it's a really crappy thing to do and gives all reviewers a bad name so so I went to Twitter and typed in her name and I guess she's moving to London mid pandemic um I don't know if there's a timeline or something on that 
or whatever. And then I saw in the thread that she's selling arts, I guess on Depop. Um, and I didn't go look at that. So I don't have the receipt for that. Um, but apparently she's like bundling books together, but basically saying the arc is free, but technically you're paying for the entire stack of books. So I don't know. There wasn't a lot of receipts that I had. So I just wanted to bring it up that I did see that. And I don't know if she has a deadline or something she has to move, but it's like, you couldn't wait to move. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know her. I don't follow her. And I just tried to look briefly, couldn't find a lot. And I was like, whatever, but don't sell arcs. Just don't do that. And if you don't have to travel anywhere right now, don't. Okay, thanks. So this last thing, hmm, it's a never ending conversation on book Twitter and the book community, but I saw a tweet that said, I'm sorry, I personally don't find anything morally objectionable with book hauls, but I'm finding it a little hard to sympathize with people getting called out for doing them while not boosting a single donation thread link when half my country is underwater, thanks. So this is a uh, Filipino book Tuber, I think, this is also on book Twitter. And the Philippines have been hit by, I don't know if it was just one or multiple typhoons and it, it is devastating. So I've tried to share links and where places you can donate because especially for the United States, the USD, the conversion to their currency is very much in our favor. So a little bit does go a long way. But then I saw a couple other comments about book hauls and I was like, oh geez. What is going on again? What are we talking about? And so I found the original thread and it was um, from Jesse and it said, can non-content creators stop assuming most monetized booktubers make a livable wage? Unless a booktuber content creator is quite large or consistently gets really high views, our checks barely cover groceries, utilities. And that often requires a very consistent uploading schedule, which many of us living with illness, working multiple jobs, etc., cannot afford, especially when you factor in the hours upon hours of editing. It's low-key ableist classes to assume we make a survivable wage. Even larger booktubers often work at least one job, and in most cases, it is out of necessity. Please stop assuming our finances because we are monetized. In summary, I'm tired of seeing some of y'all rip booktubers apart for their book hauls, most of the books we buy are because you asked for, and then it and then it stops. Side Pony is back. Okay, I didn't realize there was one more tweet. So at the end, it said most of the books we buy are because you asked for our reviews slash books are our solace, and it's a slap in the face. So I'm assuming they meant most of the books we buy are because you asked for our reviews, comma books are our solace, and it's a slap in the face. I'm thinking because then I would say. Yes, people look to booktubers for book reviews, but you don't have to buy books to review them. You can borrow them if that's what they meant. Um, I was taking it as they said, most of the books we buy are because you asked for, and I thought they meant because you asked for them because haul gets, hauls get high views. But if they meant most of the books we buy are because you asked for our reviews, then I kind of disagree because you don't have to buy every book to review it, but who am I? So I guess that's where the conversation started. I mean, the conversation is always around. And I think I talked about this a few weeks, months ago in a video about consumerism and booktube and in book hauls. And some people criticize book hauls. I for, I for one, I enjoy book hauls for the most part. Um, I enjoy them more when people are really excited about certain books and not I totally get buying books because they're pretty, but if every single book is just like a cover buy, they're not that interesting to me. But in general, I enjoy hauls. Um, and I miss when I could just haul a lot of books too. So that's why I watch them. But um, so I don't know who was criticizing Jesse or like if they said something to them specifically, but they wrote that thread and then I saw a couple other tweets about that. And so while I definitely agree that um, now being monetized myself and obviously I'm on the lower end of monetization like with subscribers so but I obviously can see you know the calculation of how much and how much you get paid not a lot of money um and so I definitely get that and I know it's easy to assume it's like okay well you're monetized now you must be making a lot of money and no but I would love to know what Bailey Sarian makes because <laughs> our videos constantly get at least a million views but that's not the point. Um, I think that 
yeah don't assume what people make but then also nigel stop don't assume what people make if you don't like hauls don't watch them um i enjoy hauls i enjoy unhauls but the only part that i kind of questioned was um in summary i'm tired of seeing some of y'all rip booktubers apart for their book hauls most because books most of the books we buy are because you asked for i'm guessing they meant them so that part was a little weird to me like i know i guess they mean like book hauls do so well so it's like well yeah i'm gonna haul books at film hall because they get a lot of views that's what i'm assuming but yeah i don't know that part was just a little weird to me but anyway i just wanted to bring that up when are we not bringing it up i'll probably bring it up in another video but <sighs> booktubers for the most part don't make a lot of money or anyone who is monetized unless they have a really high viewership and we're talking like all the stupid people like shane dawson and all those assholes um if you don't like book hauls don't watch book hauls and if you can definitely donate to the philippines i have links in the description especially if you're from america and you have anything to spare because it will go a long way but i definitely understand we are still amidst a pandemic um a lot of people are out of work so i get it but i just wanted to bring that up and highlight that i have links to that in my description so you're getting a lot of side pony i'm so sorry i usually have a note where i keep track of all the things people send me and i didn't this week so i keep going through my screenshots and finding new things so at least you can see my cute christmas tree this time instead of my bland ass curtains but this is the last thing i swear so this is about jennifer l armin trouts from blood and ash which is a very popular book right now um i think it's a fantasy romance i'm not sure but the screenshots i have are from a white book reviewer but the original ones that they are talking about are from a black book reviewer so the original reviewer said so i think the first one because it's kind of covered up says hey poppy's best friend from ash and blood is a black brown person of color named tawny lion with tawny rich brown skin curly hair and acts as her handmaid that has no personality or point but there to further poppy's plot because I deadass thought I was going crazy, that I read the book and character wrong, because no one's been talking about it. Yo, her best friend and maid is a black brown girl who is given to the royals. She's naive, can't defend herself, and has virtually no personality. That's our representation, lol. They said, hey, yo, I don't care that Poppy couldn't eat in public. Yes, she's been through horrific shit, and the trauma is explained really well and how it's handled. However, that doesn't make the use of Tawny and Kieran not racist. They are black characters used to serve the white characters. Do not talk over people of color when we're explaining our representation is important and why shit like this is racist. So again, I have not read this book and I've seen it everywhere, but I hadn't heard anybody make this commentary. So that's a big old yikes, especially written this year or last year. Ugh, not a good look. Um, if you've read this, uh, what are your thoughts? Let me know. My arm is tired. But look at my tree. Isn't it cute? Thank you. Look at Nigel's little bed. Ooh, it's so cute. That's really all for this week. Publishing is a hot damn mess and I don't know when they're gonna get it together. I hope these publishers being called out on social media, like they'll get embarrassed or something or I don't know, care about their reputation and so they actually pay people. I, I you know, it seems simple and somehow they're still fucking it up. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Um, I would say I do these every Tuesday, but it depends on what's going on in the bookish community, but at least is a couple Tuesdays per month. Always check out my description. There's always links to my social media, things I reference in the video, important things that are going on in America and worldwide. And just leave me a comment about any of these things. How do you feel about any of the topics I've discussed? If I missed anything this week, because I am not all knowing, so I tend to miss things or if I misinterpreted something, definitely let me know. But thank you for watching and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.